Uh, my name is Shadi Reyes. I am interventional cardiologist at Detroit Medical Center. The topic for this webinar would be complete revascularization. Does one size fits all? Uh, please uh, welcome uh, our uh, panelists today, uh, Dr. Jeff Chambers, Dr. Benjamin Fury, and Dr. Philippe Genero. Uh, we have great topics lined up for you. Uh, as a housekeeping items, uh, please, if you have any question, use the Q&A box. Uh, that is down in your Zoom link. Uh, similarly, if you have any, uh, we also will be throwing some polls to, between, the, between the presentations, please uh, uh, push in your poll and your options as we speak. That help us a lot improving our webinar as well as as a feedback for the organizers. With that, I would like to uh, introduce our first speaker is Dr. Philippe Genero. Uh, he is an interventional cardiologist and internationally recognized leader in structural heart disease and complex coronary intervention. He has been a practicing interventional cardiologist for more than 12 years. Dr. General is the director of structural heart program at Morristown Medical Center. Dr. General has served as uh, the primary and co-investigator on more than 200 clinical trials and has published more than 300 articles in peer review journal. A celebrated researcher uh, since the beginning of his career, he was awarded uh, the prestigious Thomas uh, Lemire Sp Spirit of Interventional Cardiology Young Investigator Award at the 2012 uh, TCT Scientific Symposium, which is a very prestigious award. Dr. Genero received his medical degree at uh, University de Montreal, Montreal, Quebec, uh, Canada, and performed his interventional cardiology and structural training at Columbia University in New York City. He's also very active on social media, and he is very engaged and always happy to answer questions on social media. Welcome, Philippe, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for this uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me and see my screen. Everything is perfect, thank you. All right, so it's my pleasure today um, to discuss among a panel of friends from all around the world um, about complete revascularization, especially using uh, the uh, OptoWire and the Opsense uh, the device. So my topic uh, is complete revascularization, what should we aim for? Um, and I'm gonna talk through a case to illustrate what we should aim for uh, in 2020. Uh, here are my disclosure. Uh, I'm going to start with a, a case I did uh, recently, actually, yesterday. Uh, she's a 36 years old female, very young, came with a non STEMI with positive troponin with an inferior wall T wave inversion. Uh, she's on uh, insulin, she uh, has diabetes. Um, and I'm going to show you the uh, angiogram that we did. This is an angiogram that was done actually a few weeks ago. As you can see, the culprit lesion, uh, very tight RCA lesion, uh, mid lesion. Uh, potentially uh, a little bit of calcification there, but very tight lesion. When you go on the left system, she has an intermediate circumflex lesion and also OM1 um, that we're going to discuss later. Uh, and she has uh, a tight LAD, uh, mid LAD lesion, uh, and also diffuse distal LAD uh, lesion with uh, a tight diagonal. So obviously, um, and this is the spider shot and the um, the, core, the cranial shot, as you can see, showing also tight diagonal and tight LED. And the circumflex, I was unsure. Um, I can see here the distal uh, circumflex may be severe, but uh, it is difficult to, uh, to um, identify the severity of the lesion. So obviously, diabetic patient, young patient, we discuss, uh, we stop the case, we discuss with the heart team, uh, should we do a cabbage on this patient, uh, PCR, the RC only, and reassess. Um, should we do physiological assessment? Um, should we aim for a functional complete revascularization? So I can tell you right away, uh, she was turned down by ca for cabbage because of the LAD, uh, was diffusely diseased, um, and the surgeon didn't want to um, do the cabbage only for RCA and for the circumflex. Um, so uh, the patient was sent back to me uh, where we elected to do a, a functional complete revascularization. I'm going to discuss a little bit. So I don't want to take you through the detail uh, of this uh, PCI, but we, we stand at the RCA, we stand the uh, mid portion of the RCA and the prox, we stop um, at that time. This is the picture when I bring back the patient um, actually yesterday <clears throat> for to complete the uh, re revascularization. So good result on the RCA. Um, and then we decided, I decided to do the PCI of the LAD and D1 and to do a functional assessment of the circumflex and the OM1. So this is a very straightforward uh, diagonal 
predilatation with a stent placement uh, with what I believe a pretty good uh, result. Um, then we went to uh, the LAD, um, wire the LAD. It was very, very uh, diffuse disease. Um, balloon the LAD and then place a stent. I want to try to minimize the number of stents, so I stopped there thinking that uh, the job was over and then I, I went to interrogate the circumflex. So I, I, I took the absence up, up the wire um, and, and did a DPR actually of the OM and the circumflex. The DPR, the circumflex surprisingly was 0.96 and the DPR actually of the OM1 was 0.97 which you know, uh, is, is normal. But when I was looking at the picture, I was not happy actually with the LAD. It seems that uh, it was diffusely disease. So what I did, I took the same up the wire after um, assessing the, the circumflex and um, the OM1 and, and I interrogated the, um, the LAD. And surprisingly, I didn't go distally. I just assessed this portion and the DPR was 0.83. Uh, so I was very surprised, but um, um, actually, not that surprised, uh, but I think uh, I was happy to have done that. So what I did, I just completed the PCI uh, for complete functional revasque with a stand in the proximal uh, LAD. Um, with a pretty good result and I ended up and I was pinching a little bit of diagonal. Um, so this is still the opto wire in the LAD. I took another Sion blue wire and did a little kissing. And what I did after that, I took the opto wire, did the post PCI uh, DPR, which was 0.96, and then pulled back wire uh, the uh, diagonal with the opto wire, and the DPR was 0.95. So I was very happy with the case. Um, it was a, what we call a complete functional revasque. Since the RC was a comp the culprit lesion was revascularized, uh, then I follow with um, the assessment of this circ and the OM, which was negative. And then I, I finished the job with the LED D1 with uh, a guidance by function, uh, the guidance by the DPR. Um, so this case illustrated a little bit what I believe should be done and complete revast based on physiology. And then Jeff uh, Chamber will talk a little bit about the value of the doing the DPR after the case. Um, so based on this case, uh, what should we aim when we want to do a complete revascularization? So first of all, I just want to start by saying that when we're dealing with multiple vessel disease, our eyes is very bad to assess lesion. And this is a slide that everybody knows, but when we look at all lesion that we have on 200 patient, stable patient, and we do FFR and all these lesions vary between zero and 70%, you can see that the FFR is all over the place and, and there's not a good concordance between our eyes and the physiology. A lot of lesion that were uh, 30% actually were significant uh, by FFR and the opposite, a lot of lesions that were 70% are negative by FFR. So very important to say that, like I, I show in the, the, the first, my case, there's a discrepancy between eyes sometimes and, and, and physiology. And this manuscript is really embody a little bit of this, of this concept. This was um, 115 patients with three vessel disease based on the angiography visual assessment from FAME study. And when we do the FFR, actually only 15, 14% ended up being three vessel disease. Um, and, and the vast majority ended up being one or two vessel disease. So you can reclassify a patient uh, and at, at least uh, you, you have the real picture of what should be revascularized. And that's very important because sometimes we aim for complete revas, but we are revascularizing patients that don't need to be revascularized and vice versa. This is another uh, finding actually from the um, um, the FAME-1 trial, when you look at more, uh, most 500 patients and you assess the syntax score in, uh, and, and you see that 33% were low intermediate risk, one third and one third high risk. And when you do the assessment of the FFR, you reclassify a lot of patients. And at the end of the day, most of them uh, are either uh, low or intermediate risk uh, by the syntax score. So only a third of these patients um, were, um, only 20% were high risk. Uh, and actually 32% were moved to the lower risk. So very important, again, you can convert a patient that you believe needs surgery to uh, potentially better serve initially uh, by PCI. So, um, so complete versus incomplete revasque. So in patients with multi multivessel disease, uh, we know, and I'm gonna show you some data that 
anatomic complete revask is associated with better outcome. And we published some uh, paper that show that if you if you you do what we call a reasonable revascularization with a residual syntax or less than eight, you have better outcome than if you less if you let a lot of disease behind. But what we should be aiming more is functioning complete revask. And actually, there's data that show that compared to incomplete revask, uh, it's probably associated with better outcome. Um, so first of all, the residual syntax score. So we described that for the first time in 2012. Um, and what is the residual syntax score is the calculation of the syntax score after revascularization. And that just reflect the degree uh, of residual atherosclerosis. And we show that the more you left behind, the, the, the worse the prognosis is. Uh, and this is the concept, this is the baseline syntax score of a patient that has 14. Um, you have lesion on the RCA, uh, distal RCA, LAD, and diagonal, you end up with 14. And then when you do the PCI, you remove, um, um, you remove eight, the delta score, score, syntax score is eight, and you end up with six, which this patient actually probably will have a good prognosis. But keep in mind that the syntax score in, involves lesion of 50% or more. So there's a lot of lesion that will be 50 to 70% that will probably be significant, non-significant by, um, by um, assessment, functional assessment. So this is exactly what you saw. These lesions are probably not significant uh, by FFR. Uh, and that's, that's the issue with the angiographic assessment. So we show actually that the higher the residual syntax score uh, is the worse the prognosis. And especially if you let eight or more behind, you have, 22% chance of maize at one year. So that's the concept of don't let too much disease behind, but this was only with angiography. Uh, Vazim Farouk from uh, Rotterdam showed the same concept in the syntax trial that if you let more than eight behind, okay, of syntax score, so probably one or two lesion, um, you have 60% of maize at five years. So leaving lesion behind that are significant is associated with worse prognosis at uh, follow-up. Um, I think what is very, uh, very elegant is these, this group that show that when you do functional assessment, okay, um, the residual syntax score and geographically speaking have no, have no value. So if you, if you have a, a syntax score more than eight residual, doesn't matter if you don't do uh, FFR. So what we really should do is really do the functional results in tax score, or, do, or just assess what you left behind, which is significant. And when you left behind functional significant lesion by FFR uh, or by physiology assessment, this is where you have a worse prognosis. So the complete revascularization should aim to revascularize everything, which is sizable, obviously, but significant by a physiology. So, um, I'm, I'm going to stop there, but I think and I, what I tried to show is anatomic complete revask is associated with improved outcome after PCI, but functional complete revask should be what you should be or what we aim for, and, and guide by FFR may result in even better outcome um, because we don't want to let behind what is significant by a, a FFR. Um, and when we deal with multivessel disease, we should clearly aim for achieving complete revask uh, with physiology assessment in all territory. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, we can open for discussion. Um, and thank you for having me here. Thank you, Philip, so much for a great, great presentation. Any question from the panel? I have a couple of questions to Philippe. And by the way, we have a poll on if you'd like to pull your answer as well. Uh, Philippe, I have a, a very interesting uh, data uh, number one and congratulations for a successful case as well the um the case you did initially let's say you are in COVID time as you know and where our, you should minimize patient encounter in the hospital as as low as possible how what is your approach do you do usually complete revask in one setup ad hoc or you rather stage things send the patient home bring him back for complete revask so that's a very good question. So I will say that in New Jersey, we've been touched very impact very um, importantly, and we, we change a little bit our approach. And you're right. Um, we try to be much more efficient in all form of uh, efficiency uh, and everywhere. So obviously in the cath lab, first of all, we tend to do um, to do more PCI than send to cabbage when we have borderline cases. 
First, we try to revascularize what is really crucial. And if um, everything needs to be revascularized, we revascularize, we try to be efficient, minimize yes. contrast, use physiology, uh, and do in one setup. Obviously, um, giving that it's safe to do. So we try to be efficient, to minimize, to do what we don't need to do, and to maximize and optimize what we need to do. Uh, and I think physiology is, is, is a key element of this efficiency. But Philippe, do you, th do you think your case mix has changed a little bit from jumping to bypass sooner during COVID to doing less bypass and trying to push the envelope on PCI more, even including like uh, supported PCI and pellet supported? Have you guys seen a shift to either of you or, yeah. or in your practice? Yeah, so we, we in, especially in the last uh, two, three months, when the peak was there, even for TAVR, you know, in their, even for real divider placement. So we try to be more percutaneous, more efficient, try to same, do same day discharge or next day discharge and minimize the CCU bed and minimize the vent. So that was really true, I uh, will say three, two, three months ago. Um, and we learned a lot, actually. We learned that patients do good and they do uh, as good as uh, if you send to surgery sometimes. So I think some of this behavior stay with us. Um, and um, definitely um, now that we have a second wave, we, 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 we start to ramp up and do the same, definitely. I can give you- we're, uh, we're, kind of doing the, we're kind of doing the same thing a little bit. I think whether it's intentional or not, we've tried to minimize ventilator time, ICU beds, um, just because we don't have any. So we're pushing the PCI envelope and I think we've done more high risk PCI. And I think, like you said, I think we're gonna probably stick with that in, the, in a lot of these cases, especially using uh, physiology guided three vessel disease or multi vessel disease. Try to interrupt. Yeah, I agree with the chambers with you and uh, Gennaro is, uh, it's also a transition of care, like post cabbage patient need to go to rehab and if they add COVID positive or COVID time, let's just complicate things in the throughput, holding a bed in the hospital. So we have a lower threshold now to do PCI after running with a heart team approach. And I think uh, something, yeah. sometime uh, I will say that the decision is made to send to cabbage based on. LED, proximal LED lesion, left main. And sometimes when you do the assessment by physiology, you realize that it's not that severe. Maybe you don't need to send to cabbage and you can just do the culprit, which is uh, significant by physiology. So I think absolutely that, that should change and probably stay because it's probably best practice. Uh, maybe a question for you, Philippe. Uh, and before a, a, a remark, because uh, your case is uh, very interesting, very typical for, for uh, perspective of uh, discrepancy between anatomy and uh, physiology, uh, especially on LAD, proximal LAD. No, with uh, with uh, experience of FFR, we know that proximal LAD, a uh, small 30, 40 percent of stenosis is uh, is uh, crucial to uh, to assess because it's often positive at the opposite uh, tight stenosis of the marginal due to a small amount of myocardium is uh, less often positive. But do you rely 100% of, uh, of, uh, of the physiologic uh, guided with DPR, with rest uh, in indexes, or do you still do uh, uh, mm -hmm. FFR with adenosine? Yeah, so I, I would say that, you know, pr personally, if the uh, DPR is depressed, like, you know, 0.7, or I, I don't give adenosine, you know. I uh, don't switch to FFR. At the beginning, I was doing it just because I want to prove, to, I, I want to see, I want to have my little uh, confirmation that this, this thing works. Um, but I do it when it's borderline, you know, 0 0.89, 0 0.9, 0 0.88. I, around these, I, I, around these number, I, I, I still do it, especially on this patient. You know, if I had a 0 0.87 or 8 or 9 on this patient, I will do it. I will have done it because she's young and, um, but yes, I use it, you know, I will say probably 10% of the time. Okay, uh, one question from the audience, maybe we can pull the panel. Uh, what percentage of patients do you perform post-PCI functional assessment? Start with Philippe. Yes, yeah, so if it's there, I do all the time because the wire is there. I, I don't know why we should not do it. Um, and then I try to react. Uh, one, one thing I didn't show is, uh, uh, you know, maybe Jeff will talk about it. This patient, uh, the first FFR, um, a DPR was... Uh, was 0.91, so I took a 3.5 balloon and post dilated a multiple place, and then it become 0.96. So I I did that because the wire was there. Um, mm -hmm. Then come the question: Should we do also uh, imaging? And Benjamin would talk about that, maybe an hybrid approach. But um, I, I will say I, when the wire is there, I do it. Yes, absolutely, uh, Benjamin. 
what's your percentage of post PCI FFR uh, DFR? Uh, uh, FFR more FFR in France, but uh, we do. Uh, if we, we 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 use FFR, we always use it. Uh, quite always use it after PCI. So I would say it's uh, maybe thirty percent of cases. Okay, uh, Dr. Chambers. Post yeah, so a high percentage of time, uh, you know, really depends on the wire, and we're using a lot of um, the opto wire. We have opto wire three, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But that makes it really easy to check yeah. your results at the end. It's a very usable wire. So to answer your question, um, I would say the majority of the time we do a post uh, PCI FFR, and I'll hopefully convince everybody to do it more after my talk. Yes, absolutely. So while you are launching your slides, Dr. Chambers, uh, the first poll, when assessing complete revask, what tools do you mostly use? 42% uh, said pressure wire. So hopefully that will change or uh, we see more physiology for complete revask based on what Philippe showed us uh, on his slides. All right, Dr. Chambers, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Chambers. Uh, he graduated from Wayne State University Medical School in 1989. Yeah, I went to Detroit receiving where you're at right now. Exactly. We, we, are, we changed our position. <laughs> 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 and cardiology training at Minnesota, where I did my cardiology as well. Uh, Dr. Chambers has been with the Metropolitan Heart and Vascular Institute since 1995 and is the medical director of uh, Cath Lab and medical uh, director of research. His professional uh, interests include coronary artery disease, structural heart, and uh, cardiovascular research. And for disclosure, I attended one of Dr. Chambers' courses and was one of the best life courses, that's before COVID, uh, that I had a, a lot of uh, kind of close next to him kind of experience in the lab uh, treating complex coronary intervention. Dr. Chambers, thanks for being here, the ground in Europe. Well, thank you for the introduction, so appreciate it. So I'm gonna talk about and then assessing your post PCI results. So when is your PCI complete? That's a question we always ask, right? Are we done? Is it good enough? But we really need to do more post PCI assessment and looks like about 40% on this poll. Um, and I think these are physiologists attending this talk. So it's probably higher than normal. Um, I think with the general population of cardiologists that it's hard enough to get them to do it the first time, but I think there will be some good evidence to try and do it afterwards as well. So why do we wanna do that? Well, we know that residual ischemia carries poor prognosis, and I'll show you some data to support that. We can help determine the mechanism of residual ischemia, so untreated lesions, inadequate stent results, and then diffuse disease. And ideally, we can potentially change the outcome. Philippe had a great case where he changed the FFR significantly or the DPR significantly, and, the, and that'll probably improve the outcomes. So the first question is after PCI, how often is your FFR abnormal. And this is all gonna be mostly FFR because that's where most of the data is. Gradients, but I just am concentrating on FFR for this talk. So uh, this is a study that, that looked at, at uh, almost uh, uh, 700 lesions. And it depends really what your cutoff is post, post uh, PCI. But if you look at the very low, less than 0.8, about 10%. And if you get less than 0.9, about 50% of the time you have an abnormal um, FFR post PCI, so you're leaving behind residual ischemia. And so does it predict prognosis? Well, there've been a number of studies. I'm not gonna do the, the PowerPoint, death by PowerPoint and show you all the studies, but let's just go through, here's the list. So I've included this if you wanna look at it, but there are multiple studies looking at really the long-term follow-up up to two to three years. And I'll highlight just a few of the key studies. So this is the first study um, by, um, Nico in 2002, um, really this is with bare metal stents and balloon angioplasty, and he looked just at a six month time frame. But you can see if your FFR is significantly abnormal, you know, less than 0.8, your event rate at, at uh, 30 days is, um, or event rate at six months is 30%. So significantly, uh, significantly high event rate. This is pooled retrospective data from FAME 1 and FAME 2, and they really divided it into tertiles of values, kind of less than 0 0.87 and then around 0.9. And if they looked at a composite endpoint at two years, which is basically, um, they looked at vessel-oriented uh, vessel, uh, failure, but it's really almost the same as target vessel failure. And if you really look, um, the failure rate's you know, pretty high at two years, especially if you, until you get up to like the 0.9, where you start to see a significant change in the, in the uh, long-term event rate. 
it's another way to look at it, but you can see really that low FFR has a 10% you know, event rate out to two years. Um, there's a meta-analysis that looked at 37 studies. And again, they divided it into tertiles. And you can see where your FFR is very low, your event rate um, at three years, again, not very good, out to 40%. Um, the mid, mid tertile was about 30%. The lower tertile is still about 20%. Uh, That's another study looking at um, FFR over time. And you can see uh, survivability was significantly better if your FFR was better than 0.86 versus less than 0.86. Uh, DK crush study was one of our largest studies that was about 1500 patients. Again, you can see that there is prognostic value. And if you look at the slides, this is uh, death. And then if you look at three year TVR, again, significantly different if you get a good post PCI FFR. So conclusion uh, summary of this uh, series of slides that it does predict prognosis. So then the question is what value is considered abnormal? So what's your cutoff for FFR post? Well, here's the major studies looking at different time points. Most use 0.9, but some use 0 0.86, 0 0.88. If you really look at uh, some of these trials, here's the, the FAME trial, which looked at, they, they used 0.991 as their cutoff. And then the DK crush study, one of the larger studies used 0.88. But fortunately there was a, a meta-analysis, 105 studies, and clearly the cutoff value seems to be 0.9 where there's a change. But I just wanna also make the point that it is a gradient, right? So there's not one firm cutoff. And we talk about the gray zone, we need to consider, you know, is it, is it worth doing something more in that range? So everything's arranged, but 0.9 seems to be the, if you had to pick one cutoff seems to be the best. So then the next question is, okay, why is your FFR abnormal, right? So we need to determine, is there an untreated lesion? Is there an adequate treatment at the site? Is there diffuse disease or microvascular disease? So let's look. So of course you have to do a pull, pull back. Here's, a, uh, here's an example. So here's the circumflex OM1 has a very severe lesion, obviously a very abnormal um, FFR to begin with 0.74, but you have lesions both proximal and distal. And then, so we always put the stent in and then we reassess. Well, look, now this one becomes significant and distal is also significant. So the first thing you need to do if your final FFR is abnormal is do a pullback and make sure there's no other significant epicardial disease. Philippe's case demonstrated that with that proximal LAD needing treatment. And this is another example where you treat the proximal disease. Then the second issue is with the PCI site. So here's kind of an example with a figure that shows what can happen. So um, you can have plaque prolapse, which ha happens occasionally. You can have um, underexpanded stents, uh, classic calcium underexpanded stents. Malapposition, you know, you can see edge dissection, something need to determine. So there is an edge dissection. And then I think most importantly, there's residual disease, geographic miss. So these are the things you need to look for. And imaging is important with OCT or FFR to really determine if you can do that. And if we look at the studies, here's a, here's a study looking at uh, some of the reasons for abnormal uh, post-PCI FFR. Residual disease, not a minimal, the treatment was the biggest majority. Unknown, 37%, that's probably some of the microvascular disease. But there was distal plaque, um, a proximal plaque, stentor expansion, and edge dissection. So there's about a third of the time when you can make a difference. Next question, can we improve with additional inter intervention? So can we change the results? Philippe showed us in his case we could. Um, and this is another example of where you can um, do additional intervention about 35% of the time. IVUS OCT with further stenting, further post dilatation, or treatment of the distal vessel or proximal vessel. And that actually does change the outcomes. Here's FFR greater than 0.9 versus less than 0.9, significant difference in outcomes out to, uh, out to a year. Skip this one. A couple other studies looked at the same thing. This is the doctor's OCT trial. Again, stentor expansion, they found 42%. Incomplete coverage, about 20%. Edge dissection, relatively high. But they were able to change the, the value and improve outcomes. And here's the Lumen study. Again, post-PCI values increased uh, significantly if you did additional balloon dilatation or additional stenting. So you can actually change the outcome. Um, this was uh, recently published in JAMA, but it kind of summarizes 
If you have focal disease and you treat it, your prognosis is good. If you have diffuse distal disease that you can't really treat, your prognosis is poor. And I thought it'd include uh, uh, one slide looking at uh, microcirculatory resistance after PCI. So this is the microvascular disease and you can see there is still a significant difference in outcomes based on your microvascular resistance. And that's something that we really haven't found a great way to, to change that. Um, so what's my point on this? So you need to consider when you're doing your post PCI results, there is a time to quit. Um, if it's diffuse distal disease, you're probably not gonna do more by additional stenting a balloon. And that might have to be something you end up having to live with. So I'm gonna talk just a little bit about the wires. I know I mentioned that earlier, but as we do more and more post PCI assessment, you know, we're asking these wires to do crazy things, tortuosity, distal lesions, jailed side branches, um, I think the fiber optic is important because it leads to a better wire design. And if we looked at the Opto 3 wire, I'll say the two most important things about this wire are one, it's a great, a great wire that you can work over. Um, you can reconnect and, and it's, uh, the, the, um, the fiber optic is sort of immune to conditions to, to um, um, moisture so you can reconnect easily. And then I think resting gradients, I didn't talk a lot about that, but you can connect right away and you know, you don't have to give adenosine, it doesn't take time. So you can really do three vessels pretty quickly. Um, drift is also important. So you have to have a good wire that has very minimal drift. The OptiWire 3 does, does very well in that category. So in summary, I would say we need to always finish with physiology. It's not uncommon for our post PCI to be, FFR to be abnormal. Uh, the cutoff should be 0.9. And um, if it's low, it, it has worse outcomes. We need to determine the underlying reasons, uh, pullback and assess your stent results. You can do inter additional intervention that may improve long-term outcomes. The microvascular is still difficult to treat and the wire is very important in being able to reconnect and determine resting gradients. So let me finish with a quick case. So this is a 74-year-old female. She had uh, had an in, uh, inferior STEMI. So here, here's the angiogram. So there's the circ lesion, baseline circ lesion. Here's the LED lesion, so obviously very bad. How about the diagonal? We don't really know, but we know the LED is bad. Here's the right coronary, which was the culprit. We can see there's a cutoff down there in the distal right coronary. So we finished the right, we fixed the right right away and got a good result with you know pretty good flow. So we went on and finished the other. So here's uh, staged, we staged the LED for two days later, uh, same hospital stay. And so we did um, a resting uh, DPR in the D1, which was abnormal. So we know we need to treat that whole section right there. So it changes your strategy. And we did IVUS and we can see four quadrants of calcium in the proximal LED right here. So we need to treat that as well. And we can see that on IVUS that it's very bad. So we did orbital atherectomy of the LED and then um, uh, with 1.5 crown. And then we rewired D1 with, uh, with the opto wire since we had it available, it's a very good workhorse wire. And then stented the LED across the D1. And uh, then we stented the proximal LED and we pulled the wire out to avoid trapping. Then we rewired with the, uh, with the opto wire in the D1 and we did POTS. And the DPR was abnormal in the D1 after we fixed the LED. So we felt good about the LED result. We wear the diagonal, oops, sorry. And then we uh, was, did a stent finish with kissing balloons. Sorry, and there's our, there's our final result on the, on the LED. And we finished with physiology, the DPR and the D1 after kissing balloons, part of the LED was 0.94. So we finished with physiology to make sure our result was good. So thank you for your attention and uh, everybody stay safe out there. Thank you so much, Dr. Chambers. Great presentation. Uh, any question from uh, Benjamin or Philippe? No, it's a nice, very nice case. Again, physiology is the key. And uh, so uh, if I understood uh, uh, clear, uh, your uh, octowire was jail at the first time for the in the D1 yeah. and after you, you pull it back to, to put a second stent. Exactly. So we've been doing that with the OptiWire. So I didn't go over the details, but the um, they changed the housing on the OptiWire 3. So it's more round than square. So we feel pretty good about jailing it. There was actually a, a study that looked at 
the ability to jail the OptiWire. The nice thing about that is you know right away. So if you're if you're uh, FFR or DPR is abnormal, then you know you're going to treat it. So then you have to pull out rewire. If it's not, if the uh, DPR is great, then you're done. You just pull the wire and you don't have to do anything. So we, we talked a little bit about efficiency of cases, and, and that's something we've been doing um, with bifurcations. Now, like you pointed out, when you put that second stent in, I don't really want to trap it between two layers of metal. So you mm -hmm. have to pull it in that case. But you at least know if you have to come back and treat the diagonal or not. That's great. Speaking into the durability of the wire and also torqueability, and uh, we use the whole case with one wire, one pressure wire for doing before, during, and after, and even crossing complex uh, yeah. multiple layers. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good tribute to how the wire can perform. Absolutely, uh, Dr. Chambers. In in regard to how how is your discussion usually with the CV surgeon in regard for multivisal disease patients? I think we touched on yeah. it at the beginning, but how how does it run in your program? Yes, yeah, so we've uh, we've we have the hard team approach like everybody, and we have actually two meetings a week. We have a Wednesday and a Thursday meeting for complex cases that the surgeons attend. So we work very closely with them, and initially they they weren't. Um, too keen on physiology because they didn't really understand it. But now they're really accepting. If we tell them the, uh, the FFR is abnormal, then they know they need to do that vessel or not do that vessel. So they've really, really come around. And I think COVID has, has helped with that to really spark them to, to do the minimal they need to do. Great. Um, when, do you use, when do you think uh, the imaging would be complementing physiology? In what cases? Yeah, so we do a lot of Im imaging as, uh, as well. Um, you know, if the phys if you're done and the physiology is perfect, then you may not need imaging. But if the if the um, physiology is abnormal, then we image um, to really understand why um, is the stent result perfect? Have we optimized it? Um, oftentimes, we'll do a pullback first, and if we find another lesion, then we stent that, do physiology again. But if it's still abnormal, we we image. And I would say, you know, any complex stuff, left main, proximal ID, we try and image just to make sure we optimize our result. Uh, just going over the results of the uh, poll, I mean, when using pressure wire, multiple vessel, do you use uh, the same wire to do post? Majority of the 57% of the, um, uh, said, yes, they use the same wire and they do post PCI uh, physiology assessment, which is, I think that's really promising, 57. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic number. Yeah. And uh, all right. So while uh, Benjamin getting ready for the next uh, a presentation yes all right so uh, uh dr benjamin uh, fury he is an interventional cardiologist based in cardiovascular institute uh grenoble france uh, since 12 years after uh, his md degree in university hospital of uh, grenoble and interventional fellowship in uh, laval university of quebec city his specific center uh, of interest and experience are uh, transradial intervention CTO interventions, carotid interventions, and minimalistic interventions. He also contributed to uh, spread the direct wire pacing uh, technique in the field of TAVI with a randomized study called Easy TAVI. Uh, thank you, uh, Benjamin, for being here. Thanks for, for your time and preparing for the slides. Thank you, uh, all of you. Uh, thank you for this uh, kind invitation about um, talking uh, physiology on a case-based multivessel di disease uh, PCI on a very uh, extreme old lady. So this is a, a case we've uh, done uh, three weeks ago on a 90 years old uh, lady, which is very active and uh, complains about, about uh, exercise dyspnea. She's very active. So we, uh, uh, we, we did a MIBI uh, scan, who showed, um, which showed um, a large anterior ischemia she had also uh, high blood pressure and diabetes. She underwent also a pacemaker uh, a few uh, years ago and is under anticoagulation. So we took his, this lady uh, in the cat lab, assessed the core angiogram that uh, you're gonna see now, which mainly shows a uh, trivessel disease with intermediate um, RCA lesion with a uh, tight stenosis of this uh, marginal branch, third marginal branch, uh, short and uh, tight, and also a proximal LAD lesion with which uh, caught maybe 60-70% angiographically. So our plan today is to uh, treat this uh, 
uh, as minimalistic as possible with, of course, uh, FFR guided uh, PCI and FFR assessment of first the marginal branch because the ischemia is anterior, then uh, IVIS and treat this uh, proximal LAD with also FFR on the mid LAD, which uh, uh, code maybe 50% and geographically, and then uh, assess uh, physiology and anatomy also. So this is the, 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 the setup with, with a six French radial approach uh, with a slender introducer, XB 3.5. So we, uh, we uh, flush the guiding, of course, we do, uh, we do the equalization in the left main and then we push the wire down the lesion here with this OptoWire 2. We only have the OptoWire 2 in, uh, in Europe right now. So we uh, pull back the, the needle, of course, flush the wire, reconnect the wire on the connector, and then assess the rest index, the DPR. We often do in France FFR, but here in that case, you will see uh, the DPR tell, tell the, the truth because it's uh, very obvious at 0 0.56. So this uh, stenosis is uh, significant. Here, the DPR at uh, less than uh, 0.6. Here, 0 0.56. So uh, we're gonna start with the marginal PCI, marginal branch. So we pre-dilate with non-compliant balloon, low profile non-compliant balloon. This lesion a bit further because it's, uh, it's um, angulated and the distal lesion here, as you can appreciate. But despite this, uh, this uh, good pre-dilatation, the long stent is not crossing this lesion. So we, uh, we try to place a um, drug editing stent. So this is not me uh, performing this PCI. This is my uh, partner, Jacques Monségur. I forgot to, to uh, make the introduction. And uh, Professor uh, Motreff from uh, Clermont-Ferrand, a city close to, to Grenoble. And then we use a body wire with another uh, wire. So this is a, a cyan blue. Uh, along the, the opto wire too. And despite this uh, aggressive uh, pre-dilatation, we couldn't cross. So again, we uh, did a pre-dilatation with a non-compliant three, uh, zero, 18 millimeters long balloon. And then we, we were able to, to go with this uh, long stance, as you can appreciate here, to treat these uh, tandem lesions. So here, we didn't, uh, we, we placed the stand. We didn't uh, make any uh, post PCI uh, DPR or FFR. It was quite uh, obvious and clear. And then with the same uh, opto wire, we um, go uh, to the LAD to treat the proximal LAD and the left main. Why the left main? Because we uh, assess the proximal LAD lesion with IVUS, uh, with this uh, Boston probe. And uh, we saw that the, the plague was um, overlapping in the left main with a large uh, left main. So we have it and uh, begin to uh, treat this lesion always with non-compliant three millimeters balloon here in the left main and uh, proximal ostial LAD. So pre-dilate and put um, large stent, which was a synergy megatron in order to overcome this decrepancy between the left main diameter and the LAD diameter and overexpand this 3.5 millimeter stand to a five or six millimeter in, in case. So uh, this is it. We place this stand, assess it angiogra angiographically and uh, uh, did a cranial, LA, uh, cranial LAO uh, incidence to place it very accurately at the ostium. So this is the inflation. We did, of course, uh, the POT, proximal optimization technique, 
with a non-compliant balloon, four millimeter here, as you can uh, appreciate. And uh, the distal marker is at the edge of the carina. Very important to, to have a good uh, balloon placement, short and large balloon to open the, the stand struts in direction of the, the cirque. So this is the pot with an angiographic control and then an IFS control also. This is the pot. So this is the, um, the uh, wire. This is a cyan blue wire, which is a pullback, a gel wire is pulled back and then re uh, catheterized in, uh, in the cirque in order to perform the the kissing balloon uh, inflation. So this is the, the view of the angiography and you, you, you can appreciate also the mid LED lesion that we want to assess with the IVUS, of course, but also uh, with the FFR. So we perform first the IVUS no, sorry, the, the FFR, which is uh, negative. The, the DPR is uh, at uh, 0 0.98, which is quite good for a post-PCI DPR. And then uh, Jacques performed a FFR assessment to be sure about what we, what we saw. And the post-PCI uh, uh, FFR was at 0 0.94, as you can see here. And it's very interesting to see that there was a discrepancy between anatomy, the IVUS on the mid LED, which was less than four millimeters square, and the FFR, which was uh, quite acceptable and quite good post PCI. So it's maybe it's the the, the answer to this uh, dogmatic maybe uh, dogmatic assessment of IVUS because this is a frail lady, it's a small bit lady. And of course, the IVUS is not the same as a, a large build uh, man, for example. So very interesting to, to see that FFR can solve discrepancy between uh, um, anatomy and physiology. And then we saw that the, the stent struts was, were not open in a third direction. So we, we did the, the final kissing inflation and this is the final result in this life man and the LAD. And this is the cranial view with an uh, acceptable result in order to um, restitute uh, uh, breath to this uh, active old lady. Excellent. So in conclusion, uh, FFR in this uh, multivessel uh, disease PCI is very helpful uh, to uh, guide everything and to keep as minimalistic as possible. It's also helpful to treat symptoms more than image, it's quite the same. And it's also helpful to decrease contrast dye injection on this uh, uh, renal impairment uh, lady and to decrease as much as, much as possible stance length. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Benjamin, great case. Uh, a question about what, what was the EF of this patient, ejection fraction? It, it was normal, 65%. Okay. All right. So I was just wondering, you did a lot of lymph name work and stuff. Uh, would you have considered uh, mechanical support? Yes or no? What's your practice? Yes, not at all. In um, I would say in Europe and in France, we, we, we don't do uh, so much um, uh, support PCI. And uh, we, we try to, to keep it uh, quick, mini invasive, radial. And uh, if we need, uh, we, we we, we, we are very helped by uh, drugs like uh, noradrenaline or uh, levosimondol, things like this. Absolutely. Any question from Philippe or Jeff? Uh, there was a great, great illustration of the discrepancy between uh, physiology and imaging. Um, I have to say that if you, um, if you show this lesion in the middle AD to 10 interventional cardiologists, I'm sure mm -hmm. nine out of 10, um, that are board certified with standard lesion. Um, so I, I would say, um, what, what is a uh, usage? I would say of uh, uh, imaging and, and, and functional assessment. How do you 
uh, work that well after, especially after post uh, PCI, where we are very comfortable mm -hmm. using imaging. And when you see a residual lesion, a dissection, or under expansion, you can go. Are you using um, FFR or DPR first? And if you, there's some anomaly, then you go with post dilation or stent or imaging. What is your algorithm? Our algorithm in France is mainly based on the hemodynamic assessment and FFR mm -hmm. for two reasons. Maybe the first one that uh, FFR is reimbursed and IVUS is not. And secondly, in, if we have some, I would say, uh, special anam anatomical uh, cases, like, uh, for example, uh, uh, acute coronary syndrome on young people, maybe we would prefer uh, imaging than FFR. And, uh, but for all um, PCI, I would say um, ambulatory PCI, we prefer FFR most of the case. Uh, question to the audience, I mean, we put it to the audience, but I would like to ask the panel about a patient coming with STEMI and you see multi visual disease, what is your approach? Do you usually do complete revasc before you take the patient off the table? Having in mind that you do not exceed the contrast limit, you are, was a straightforward, quick case. So, uh, the, so for uh, me, yeah. um, I, I do the STEMI, the culprit lesion first. And then if I get a good result, like Timmy 3 flow, no slow flow, then I feel okay to go on. Um, but I don't want, I generally don't want two major territories at risk, but I do always assess the other lesions, right? So that's where your FFR comes in. So I know if I'm not gonna do it now, do I need to come back and do it, do it later? So yeah. I tend to make sure I know what I need to do and what I don't need to do. But what does everybody else do? Yeah, yeah. so that's, uh, that's a good uh, summary of what I'm doing. So I do the culprit lesion first. Um, and then if it's easy, and it's obvious I need to do it, I do it. But if it's, um, you know, and to me the lesion, I do the assessment. So at least maybe I don't have to come back. Uh, one thing I never do is if it's like a three vessel disease and, you know, complex uh, need roto or atherectomy or what, I, 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 you don't do that at 3 a.m. in the morning. So, so I think it's dependent on the complexity. One thing I will say is I always do everything in the same admission then. You know, I don't send a patient home. So I give two, three days break to the patient, clear the kidney, CDEF, and then I can bring back the patient when the inflammation is low. Um, and uh, so I think that's my approach. Yeah, I do quite the same, but sometimes I, I like to do also a mini strategy, minimally invasive strategy in the acute phase. Uh, like uh, last week I did a young, uh, a, a 36 years old um, STEMI. Uh, I opened his right coronary artery and uh, then he, was, uh, he had the trivessel disease. So I let it like this without stenting, and then we uh, re uh, um, angio him uh, weeks ago, uh, a week after, and to assess very clearly after low um, inflammation uh, phase, to uh, assess a good FFR on trivessel, and then in that case we decide to to uh, to propose to him a cabbage, in that case for example. But uh, we, we like to do culprit lesion at the stage and then reassess the lesion. Uh, for example, with FFR, if we need to, to do a second vessel uh, in, uh, in 15, 15 days after. And otherwise, we do a non-invasive stress test if it's inter intermediate, for example. Benjamin, a question back to you. When you say you are minimalistic, so what, what, uh, if you have good physiology, do you need to still use imaging? I would say no. I would say no. So you, usually, if your physiology is reliable, you got your number above 0.94, um, you are angiographically happy, you quit the, the, the imaging. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, in terms of um, utilization of uh, FFR and adenosine, anybody has any experience or have you completely dropped the adenosine? Uh, practice what, what, uh, working on um, relying mainly on DPR and IFR? I, I, I rely on the resting uh, ratio and I only use in 10% of the time maybe when um, there's a gray zone. Um, and really? not, but most of the time I think these index are very reliable. Um, and if you're borderline, it's probably not. I mean, it's, you know, there's a spectrum, you know, if it's borderline, it's, um, probably okay not to treat it also. So it's not, 
So, but but I use it in this in these in this scenario. It, the same as Philippe. So you know, usually it's either clearly clearly good, clearly bad, or there's a range in the middle. I've been surprised though at the range in the middle. I don't know about you, you Philippe or Benjamin. Um, when I've done the FFR on some of these, sometimes it's like really abnormal, like 0.77, you know, or it's really nothing. So uh, there's been some discrepancy in the gray zone. Mm -hmm. But I do tend to, if it's 0.89 and I'm not sure, then I, then I tend to give the adenosine. And it's a very small percentage of the time, probably around 10%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it's you, quite the I, same. But I would say my gray zone is quite large. I like yeah. DPR, but uh, especially if the, the DPR is a uh, high, uh, between uh, 09 and 095, I always do FFR because we can have some good, uh, some bad surprise. Uh, in terms of, um, there, is, there is sometimes that I use imaging when I see like a post PCI and I cannot really tell where is this step up. Uh, usually I do imaging just to confirm I'm not missing a lesion or is some uh, unexpanded stent. So this is where I, uh, I think imaging would be complementing IFR, otherwise, or the pressure physiology. Uh, question I had, a quite random question came across is, when, do you use any IC nitro uh, during DPR or physiology? So I try and always do it beforehand. I always give 200 mm -hmm. in the right, 100, or 200 in the left, 100 in the right. Uh, that's Mike's, you know, before I do any physiology. So I make sure I try and eliminate any spasm. And of course, you know, good technique, make sure your guider's back, make sure mm -hmm. the catheters flush, you have good waveforms, you know, attention to detail, detail on how to do it correctly. Yeah, this is a key point. Always nitro before FFR or DPL. Yeah, I do nitro and I, I, I two, three flush, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do a, a question between two? Uh, when you do FFR, you do two measurements or only one if it's, uh, if it's uh, in the gray zone? Ah, oh, that's funny. I always do two. Too, yeah. I do too. I, I do it. I do it two, maybe even three times because it, it's so fast. If it's a resting gradient, I just measure it two or three times. Mm. It does do, really do, you, do you flush between the two measurements? I do. Yeah. I do okay. I flush. And make sure the guider's back and flush and do it again. And sometimes I'll even change the position a little bit, the distal position, mm. to see if that makes a difference. How about you? You do the same? Yeah, we do the same. We are just uh, doing. Um, a study, uh, building a study about this, and uh, we are doing a retrospective and prospective study about. Uh, that would be a great question to answer. That would be the the uh, reliability of repeat mm -hmm. measurements. That would be fantastic. It's very so do you, do you see a lot of difference. Sorry, do you see a lot of difference uh, in these two measurements? Uh, I, I cannot say everything today, but uh, it's interesting, and, and you you have to have a, a perfect technique. For example. My colleague uh, back to Canada is uh, doing flush between the two uh, measurements. I was not doing flush between uh, two, uh, two, two micros of uh, adenosine. Yeah. So uh, we have to, to be a um, homogenistic uh, technique to have a yeah, so I've, I've been doing that mostly with the resting gradients. And um, you know, anecdotally, I have seen some differences. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, when it's borderline, it's kind of become difficult. Uh, I asked this question also on a different webinar to Martin Perrin. He said you can go FFR um, if, if just to confirm that. Otherwise, you have to use some imaging if it's still borderline. And uh, um, the other question I had in a different webinar as well, if you have somebody with a positive stress test um, and uh, and a, ter in a territory, let's say lateral wall, and you do angiogram and you see a lesion there. Do you still pursue physiology? Uh, what is the, the drive for doing physiology? I have to tell you, I, I, I never trust, I never trust a stress, te a stress test. So I, I was concur I mean, to be quite honest, especially when it's nuclear. Um, I think the stress echo is great. I think the nuclear is like very difficult to um, reconcile sometimes, yeah. especially with different pa patient physiognomy, et cetera, et cetera. So, I always, um, I think we, we have the responsibility to establish a gold standard when you go to the cat lab and um, not to rely on uh, pre-testing. I think if it's obvious, so they come in with anterior scheme and they got a big LED lesion, I just treat that. Yeah. I feel confident about that. But I guess the other question, and, and I'll answer it and then turn it back to the panel. So they come in and they've got anterior ischemia and there's really nothing in the LED. Antigraphically or very little, you know, 20, 30%. What percentage of the time do you do FFR on that patient where the physiology doesn't match your angiogram? 
Yeah. yeah. I, I would say 80% of cases. What? And it's often a, it's often a, a question of doing a FFR in, in that kind of case. Yeah, I do, I do that a high percentage of the time too. And then, um, you know, sometimes it, there's an un, unseen lesion that you uncover. And other times it can be a microvascular disease too, where the FFR mm -hmm. is actually you know, abnormal distally, yeah. not much you can do about it. Yeah. And a lot of times I feel uh, in this situation, the chambers that you described, it's um, if you do a pullback, so it'll be a very diffuse lesion. Mm -hmm. It's not like a focal lesion where yeah. you can mm -hmm. see it. So that's why the stressors was positive, but usually these cases you just leave it alone right. and treat right. medically. Because right. the the one... that doesn't help. That's why I showed that one slide on the prognosis with yes. the microvascular mm -hmm. disease. And it's unfortunate. I wish we had a good treatment. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I and mean, we're coming to the top of the hour, uh, two minutes after. Thank you so everyone for your time, for preparation for the slides and for sharing your great cases and experience. Dr. General, Dr. Fury, Dr. Chambers, uh, thank you for broadcasting, especially Dr. Chambers from <laughs> Mexico <laughs> and, uh, and uh, Fury from France and uh, General from New Jersey. I am from Detroit. And this is one of the things that uh, COVID kind of uh, put people together. And this is the only time we can see ourselves without masks. So um, thank you for your time. And uh, until next time, be safe and uh, have a good day.